Today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Franklin Templeton ETFs. Ben, a couple of weeks ago on What Are Your Thoughts, I was talking to Josh about dividends, which are obviously a popular style of investing. But I was saying that if you're going to invest and dividends is your primary input, but taking that a step further, it's dividends, dividend paying stocks that have a high yield, and that's all that you're looking at, that is a recipe for disaster. Right. You can't use a single variable analysis. So most dividend strategies have have to have another component for it to make sense, right? If you just pick the highest yield, chances are you're going to pick a stock that's in trouble in some way. So yeah, but like dividend growth, dividend stability, something, anything other than just dividend alone. It's interesting because last year, defensive strategies like dividend stocks outperformed by a wide margin. And everyone wanted, everyone's clamoring for those types of strategies. Now this year, it's the opposite. Everyone is looking again for the more exciting things because those are up a lot where the defensive stuff is is taking a back seat, I guess. We talked last week about how even in good years, there's a chance for corrections along the way. Or even in bull markets, there's chances for correction. Uh, I don't think you need to have a correction for a defensive strategy to work, but it certainly can help. So Franklin Templeton has the U.S. low volatility high dividend ETF. So combining these companies that have Low volatility, neither in their share price, but also in their financials with a high dividend yield. So dividend income, discipline process, defensive positioning. Dividend strategies are, to me, one of the more intuitive defensive sort of hedge strategies that there is. It, it intuitively makes sense to almost every investor. So the ticker on that is LVHD. Click the link in the show notes if you'd like to learn more about Franklin's low volatility, high dividend index ETF. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. A little housekeeping announcement for the team. Duncan and Co. are looking for a full-time editor based in New York City. Uh, and this is somebody that has experience on the audio side of things. So if you want to join the team, you're in New York City, you're looking work for with a us. gig. Not only work with Duncan, work with us on podcasts, videos, right? Ben, a few weeks ago. Maybe like, I don't know, four weeks ago? When did I talk about buying sunglasses? It, uh, you mentioned that you lost a pair of Maui gyms. Well, come on. Let me tell a story. Okay. Don't step on my material. Well, you asked I, me a I question. Bought, well, I, I asked you when I bought them. I didn't tell you to ruin the story. Okay. I bought two pairs of Maui gyms. I bought a black pair. I bought a brown pair. And I was deciding which, you know, I bought two to return one. Oh, kind of like my wife, I guess. I bought two to return one. But... Before I could return one, I lost one. So I don't know where they went. <laughs> I mean, I, I took them on the jet ski and then they were gone. I tried to tell you. I tried to warn I don't know you. How, I don't know how it happened. So I bought these gooders. Ben's been talking about them for years. I won't say they're disposable, but they're 25 bucks. They look good. They feel good. The only problem is I, I'm, I don't know that they go that well with a hat. I like the thin, I like the thin ones on the side. You know what I mean? So I'm wearing them because I'm sick. I want to take them off. I'll take them off. But I also can't take my hat off because I'm growing my hair out. <laughs> Is that a joke? I think I think you should do the Larry David. Can I tell you one no, more I'm thing not, about... I'm not joking. Look, look at my... Well, I'll take my hat off. Look at my hair. It looks absolutely absurd. I think you should grow it out. Can I tell you one more thing about Gooders? This is not a sponsor of the show, by the way. They should be because I've been pumping them. But I just learned this week that they have a one-year warranty. So I had a pair that had a scratch on the lens. And if you send them a picture of it, a one-year warranty, they you don't have to send the old pair back. They'll just send you a brand new pair as long as they have the order number. Pretty good well, deal. Well, Maui Jim also offers warranties. If you get a scratch, if you lose, if you, but I can't. But you have to send them back. I can't send back a lost pair. Can I just ask them for a new one? Here's what someone someone DM'd me and said: Hey, listen, have a nice pair of sunglasses, but wear those to like dinners and weddings and like nice dinners. functions. Dinners. Yeah, if you go out to dinner. If you go out to dinner, sunglasses, drink, to, sunglasses, sunglasses to dinner. Well, you know, if it's an outdoor place, you have some, you know, some outdoor bars there. And then if you're going on the jet ski or you're more active, then wear your cheaper sunglasses. That's a good trade off. I do wish, I do wish I could see myself with longer hair. I think it would be hilarious. But the problem is, I, I can't. I mean, my wife would kill me. I also, you know, I'd be embarrassed. I can't actually grow it out. I think you should grow it out for the winter. I'd like to see you with George Costanza slash Larry David. <laughs> All right. According to the Economist. We should just mention Michael is is having a flu game today, not Powering doing so through. well. I don't know anyone got sick in the summer. Apparently you do. 
from The Economist, American stocks are at their most expensive in decades. I think they say five decades. So they're looking at the equity risk premium here, which is they're looking at the forward 12-month earnings yield minus the 10-year treasury. You can see from this chart here that it's crashed. Obviously, this makes sense in the context of interest rates have risen a lot and stocks have had a nice run. So it would make sense that equity risk premiums have the, – the spread has narrowed. They also said oh, – yeah? What? Sorry. Okay. I've uh, got a spreadsheet up. I, I'm working on this post. I said it last week. I'll say it again. Ben, look at this chart. I'm throwing this in the deck. This is – now, here's the, th- here's the problem. Nothing matters in the short term, right? Right. Like almost nothing matters in the short term. And things that matter in the long term, people don't position their portfolios for. That's right. You said you were going to do an earnings yield post. Because even though valuations matter a lot over a 10-year period, is anybody set their portfolio today for the next 10 years? Does anybody do that? Look at this chart. So what we're showing on the screen is the earnings yield minus the real 10-year yield. And then I show the S&P 500 12-month return from that point in time. And if you were to say, like, if you were to try and derive meaning from this chart, there is no meaning. It's a shotgun blast. It's all over the place. Now, as you extend it over, you know, even three years is really not much there. But if you got 10 years, yeah, it matters. That makes sense. The other thing is, so my, my thought was looking at the equity risk premium, like if people were just rational and I follow the fundamentals only, I don't think about psychology, why would you not be moving money from stocks to bonds, right? This is the lean into the pain, blood in the streets. But the problem is, I think one of the reasons we haven't seen more move, and, and, and obviously part of it is because T-bill yields are higher than bond yields, but bonds are still in a bear market. The stock market has made back most of the money it lost. Seven to 10-year treasury ETF still down 20%. TLT, which is a 20-plus year treasury, still down over 40%. And the zero coupon bond, ZROZ, which you said you were going to think about taking taking a spin for your short-term paper trading account, is down 54%. No, 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 I, I, That's not short-term paper. I will buy zero, ZROZ. Just I haven't bought it yet. So still down 54%, like the most duration there is. Bonds are still not only in correction territory, they're in bear market and market crash territory. So I understand why people are looking at these, these losses. We're looking at three years in a row of bond losses. If rates move up from here between now and the end of the year, it's going to be the first three-year loss in 10-year treasuries ever. Wow. Never happened before. That could happen. But money's, but money's going here. into bonds. Money's going into bonds. A little bit. But if you think about it, the stock market is going up. Why is the stock market going up and rates are, if, if a lot of money's going into bonds, why are rates rising? Right, so That's obviously, of, okay. On the on the so maybe mutual fund flows are showing, but people are selling bonds because rates. Wait, are unpack rising. that. What, what what you're saying is buying pressure should pull should should. Yes. Push price up, pull yields down, and that's not happening. Yes. The buying pressure is obviously in the stock market because the stock market is rising, but rates are rising in the bond market. That means people are selling bonds and they're buying stocks, right? So why should, why wouldn't if the risk premium equity risk premium is lower, why wouldn't people be doing the opposite? And that's because they're looking at losses in their bonds and going geez, I'm not going to put money here. Look at how much money I lost. And I think that's, obviously, there's other economic components of that, inflation and you, growth and all you, these things. You said you said to Bob Elliott on TCAF, which was a great episode, uh, that you don't think people look at yields on bonds versus stocks and make decisions. And uh, I thought you're wrong, but I didn't really want to get into it on that show. I want to talk about it here. You don't think that people look at stocks versus bonds when they, when they're like, I mean, how else do they think about risk and reward? I think they do on the margin. But I think if you look at a year like this, when, when bond yields are finally here for the first time in 15 or 20 years, why is everyone buying stocks? Because stocks have the ability to go up 20 to 40% in a year and bonds don't. Well, but there's new ones in there. So for example, Bespoke tweeted, with risk-free rates above 5%, the typically low growth, high dividend payers in the S&P, which we spoke about earlier in the show, are massively underperforming in 2023. The 101 non-dividend payers are up 20% year-to-date, while the highest 100 yielders in the index are down an average of 3.5%. And I think that it's not a stretch to say that is a direct result of, like, dividend stocks used to be bonds. Remember? Like, back in the day, like, the the 2.5-3% dividend stock was like a bond proxy. But now that bonds are actually giving you 5%. You don't need to. You don't need to own, own those. I'm just talking about the psycho- psychological component. Uh, psychological component where I think when rates fall and bonds start doing well, then a ton of money is going to pour into them. Say I think that, that's, say one more time. I think once rates start falling and bonds start doing well, then a ton of money is going to pour into them. That's what I think is going to happen. I think now is, is money's going to come back into the dividend. The dividend payers. No, I mean, I mean, I'm saying bonds. When bonds start showing gains again, not just yield, because bonds are oh, still so sitting you think, on losses. So you, th- so you think people are going to chase. 
price return in bonds, not, yes. not the yield. I think bonds turned into momentum plays. Which makes no sense. No, but it doesn't. I'm just saying, I think people look at, I'm down 20% of the bond fund. Why would I put money into it and not think through the impact of, well, the yield's 5% now. I should be I should be putting more money in this because future returns are much higher. Yeah. I do, I do also think that, so Bob Elliott mentioned to us that like a real risk here is growth accelerating, wages staying higher, inflation staying at 3 to 4% instead of the Fed's 2%. And that being a, a uh, environment where, where yields go higher as as a risk, which is funny because a lot of people predicted inflation is going to stay high and rates are going to stay high, but they all predicted it for the wrong reason. They no no one predicted higher rates and higher inflation because economic growth is going to be. Did you? I don't know if you saw retail sales were strong yet again today, and I think no one predicted that rates and inflation would stay high. People were predicting stagflation, right? No one was predicting the fact that it's going to happen because growth is accelerating the consumer remains Oh, yeah. Strong. Stagflation was a thing that people were saying. It was a big thing. And it – Yeah. No, it didn't happen. All right. Uh, Sam Rowe, here's the chart that will be in every chart curator's chart roundups tonight this week from Goldman Sachs. Nearly half of S&P 500 debt is set to mature after 2030. This is S&P 500 X Financials Debt Outstanding by Maturity. And it's like dribs and drabs in each of the next, it's five to 8% in the next, whatever, seven to eight years. And then after 2030, it's almost half of it. That's a good chart. Corporations knew what they were doing, right? Like I, I know it's easy these days to like look at CEOs and people in positions of power and, and think like, oh, that person's an idiot. I could do that job. But this is, let's, let, let's credit where credit is due. This was, this was smart. Michael. I mean, the S and P five hundred are the are the, the it's the the creme de la creme, the cream of the crop, if you will. I, there's a chart that I saw this week. I, I don't know if I put it on the doc. Maybe I did. Maybe I didn't. We'll find out about the number of bankruptcies, corporate bankruptcies, and it is it's it's on the rise. It's not not screaming, but it's it's higher. It's on the rise. Obviously, not all companies have the ability to lock in fixed debt for eight years, right? They don't have access to public markets and they just, they got, they got to pay up. And so companies that are exposed to floating rates, uh, they're, they're feeling the pain. That makes sense. This other one from Michael Semblist is corporate net interest payments as a percentage of profits versus the Fed funds rate. And the Fed funds rate has risen and actually net interest payments as a percentage of profits continues to fall. He says it's at this is 60, wild. 60 year low. It is, it's just continued to fall, which I mean, part of that probably too is profits are rising. So interest payments used to follow Fed funds rate. Not exactly, but for the most part, right? It made sense. And they used, and to, be, that they used to be above it. Well, that, that relationship completely, completely broke. No, 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 Ben, the axis, the axes aren't the same. Fair. Okay. Yeah, you're right. Okay, I get what you're saying. Yeah, this is just one of those textbook breakers, right? Like higher interest rates are going to impact corporations. Well, yeah, but not if most of their debt is long-term fixed. That's true. That's a good. That's a good way to put it. Is like everything that's happened in the past three or four years has been textbook breaking. Uh, remember when buybacks were were one of the primary reasons that stocks were going up? Yes. the The whole bull market since nineteen eighty is buybacks and short covering. That's it. No, no fundamentals. There was there was a chart from Bank of America last week that I didn't include because it was sort of confusing. But the the long and the short of it is that. Q2 buybacks were down 36% year over year. Guess what? Second quarter was pretty damn strong for, for, for the stock market. So is the assumption that stock buybacks are down because companies were borrowing to make them happen? Or just because Why they're cyclical? Why is my dog Do you hear that? Yeah. She's not a barker. I think she misses me. I was at your house and... and uh... What do you think of my mudroom? <laughs> Mudroom's great. I it's I ten out of ten. You guys did a great job. Do you have a mudroom? We have a tiny, pretty tiny mudroom. Yes, nothing. Your yours is the Taj Mahal compared to my mudroom. Mine is ours is small. <laughs> we wish we would have had a much bigger, bigger mudroom. But I mean, my yeah. mudroom's not that big. What is it? Eight by ten? It's like I mean, it's a good. I, I wish we had a mudroom that big. It's 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 a it's a good size mudroom. Thank you know where I, you know where I got you though? Where we should have done our mudroom. We have a three stall garage, and uh, that's where the mudroom should have gone. You have a three car garage? A three, yeah, three car garage, yeah. What? This is what you get in Michigan. You have way more land, way more room. I don't even have a car garage. I have a garage, but I can't. You can't fit a car in there. Yeah, we got. Yeah, 
this is this is what you get in Michigan. You get more. You get to much more room for that kind of stuff. And it's interesting how you call it a stall instead of a car, like a stall garage. I guess it makes sense. That fits too. Another Midwest thing. So anyway, we're talking about buybacks because J.P. Morgan had a chart from, from the Daily Chart Book. We have seen very strong momentum in buyback announcements so far this year, but buybacks as a share of profits are still up. So it shows the S&P 500 announced buybacks, and 2023 is pretty. We're off to a pretty hot start. In fact, the hottest it's been since 2013, at least announced. I don't know if that's followed through, but then it shows S&P 500 buybacks as a percentage of earnings before interest and taxes, and it looks like it's just eyeballing. It looks like it's about average over the last 25 years. Give Not or take, bad, right? Yeah. So what's the takeaway here? Not sure. Buybacks are cyclical. I was gonna, I was going to say that that buybacks are not propping up the stock market, but it's not. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe this is just noisy. Maybe there's just not much here. Yeah. Maybe that's the takeaway. And they Noise. never and they never really have. Uh, Matthew Klein had a piece for the Financial Times about basically asking what if inflation settles in at four percent. So he's saying markets are currently pricing in the most benign possible outcome. Inflation decelerates, even as real output keeps growing briskly. Certainly possible it is at least as likely that inflation will stabilize at a rate roughly two percentage points above the Fed's 2% goal. In that scenario, short-term rates would remain at their current levels for some time, if not go even higher, which in turn would pull up longer-term yields and push down valuation multiples. That could spell trouble for assets. And he's in like the reason, so why is this happening? He says, since 1929, the average American worker's hourly wage has grown about 1.6% faster than PCE price index each year. Wages have only grown at three percentage points faster than prices 17 of the past 92 years, five of which occurred after 1956. However, the best data suggests that U.S. wages are currently rising at a yearly rate of about 5%. And he's saying that like this higher for longer is potentially going to push, keep inflation higher than most people think, even though it's falling right now, uh, and, which is another one that Bob Elliott talked about on, on TCAF with us. Here's my question. The, like the the fundamental textbook thing says this has to be bad for markets, right? If, if inflation stays higher, wages stay higher, that should be bad for multiples if, if long-term rates rise. Isn't this a good thing for profits if people are making more money? Because it'd be one thing if, if people are making more money and they're just going to save it like they did in the pandemic. I think that's a one-off, like people saving money when they get more, more of it. Now, if people make more money, they are spending it. They're not going to save it and pay down debt. Isn't it technically a good thing for profits and maybe not a bad thing for markets? Is that a possibility or not? Yeah. Possible. There's a lot. I mean, there's a lot going on here. Do you like do you think it matters though that that inflation is higher but people are making more money? Like why I come back, I keep coming back to why is this why does this matter? And a bunch of people, every time I talk about this stuff, someone Says Wait, what do you me, mean? Why does this matter? Of course, it matters. I, I think it's it's hard to predict how it matters, but if, but definitely matters. That's true. Hold hold on a sec. Yes. What? Wow. Sorry, Ben. Okay. Every time I talk about this, someone says, "Ben, you're an idiot." Wages are rising slower than inflation. That's why people are so mad. And I, I put some charts in here. They're down in the labor market section, but I'll just read them to you. So average hourly earnings since 2021 has fallen behind CPI. It's like 17%. Uh, CPI is up 17%. Wages are up 13%. That makes sense. Since Surprisingly, since 2020, U.S. average hourly earnings and U.S. consumer price index is identical because CPI fell and wages rose. And since so since the start of this decade, wages have kept up with Wait, inflation. Wait, CPI fell since 2020? Well, no, in 2020 it did. During the start of the pandemic, so I'm uh, saying, so if you if you st- go from the start of this decade, surprisingly, wages have kept up with inflation. It's just since inflation took off that wages have fallen behind. So it's more of a recent phenomenon than it is like that. It's been happening this whole decade, anyway. Well, how about uh, this? If if I told you the next two years of wages and inflation, assuming that inflation was not a, well. I don't want to assume anything. Nothing is taken off the table. If I give you the wages and inflation over the next two years, how confident are you that you would be able to predict, not to the penny, but directionally, asset prices? The only thing I would be able to predict would be T-bills. And I would say T-bills are going to be one of your best. T-bills are going to give you 6% in that scenario or whatever. If, if, if it's in what the, scenario? I'm, oh, sorry. With it, this one that I'm laying out, inflation at 4% uh-oh. or whatever. 
then in, you're going to get 6% a year for a couple of years in T-bills. That's the only thing I'd be confident on saying. Anything else, I don't know. Ben, but, a few weeks ago, you were, you were talking about how like just we get more extreme readings everywhere. These days, things happen quicker. Things move quicker. They, it's the magnitude is larger. A couple of weeks ago, when when I was laying out, like, uh, why why a short term pullback might be in order, there's just I mean, there's a long list, a long list of things that were suggesting that, and this is one of them. According to Finra margin data, this is the largest six month increase in leverage on record. This is from Goldman Sachs. So, you you are right in saying that things swing larger and quicker everywhere and like almost all data sets. And I wonder why, do you think it's as simple as information moves quicker and people are quicker to react? I think part of it is a technology. And there's no, and there's no frictions anymore with anything, right? There's no barriers. You can just push buttons. Right. I think that's it. So, but looking at this chart, it had a huge drop as well. And don't you just think that margin is a concurrent indicator? Like, when stocks are going up, there's more margin. And when stocks are going down, there's less margin. That's kind of the way. It's not like a predictive stat. It's one that follows See, the listen, market. Listen, if this, if this was predictive, there would be a margin data ETF. Right. True. <laughs> right? So, no, I don't think, I think there's, there's little signal here. But this is just, this was one of the, this is one of like 12 things suggesting that things had gotten a little bit overheated in the short term. Fair, and I would still say uh, right, that, well, th- that your ability to predict a short-term correction is uh, is nil. How's that? Not just you, totally the royal you, everyone. No, I, I come on. Of course, I totally agree. Speaking of predictions, New York Fed says survey of consumers in July puts one year ahead expected inflation at three and a half percent, the lowest since April 2021. Which I think is kind of one of the funny things about like inflation keeps falling. You're going to see these headlines probably keep falling. That that's why if it did reaccelerate. I, I the, you're, to your point, like, how can you gauge what the reaction is going to be? That would be, I, I don't know what people would think in that scenario. If inflation went down and then back up again. Well, how, let me ask you this. Is it possible that inflation goes back up, not to where it was, but, you know, from, from where was the last reading? Was it? F- a little over three. Where was the last 3.2, 3.1. All right. Something like that. So let's say it goes back up to four and a half, but without gasoline prices rising. Is that possible? Maybe. I think that that's probably the biggest risk, though, to, to sentiment is oil prices continuing to rise and gas prices going up, which they have. So been let's a say, bit. let's say, but let's just say that inflation were to rise. Man, we're doing a lot of mental gymnastics on the show. <laughs> let's just say that inflation were to rise without gas prices rising. But this, this is, I mean, this is what investing is, though. It's like you're, you're creating a range of expectations, same, right? That, that you don't know which is going to happen. I think that's instead of like, Everyone, a lot of people want the person to say, this is exactly what's going to happen. The market's going to crash or the market's going to take off. And the truth is there's a lot of different paths. Like I, I tweeted something out yesterday that um, mortgage rates 7.5%, even though they've, they've averaged 7.75% since 1970, which is kind of a fun with numbers, but it's true. And I, I just said, I cannot, the, no one predicted that mortgage rates at 7.5% or whatever they are in the housing market would remain so strong. And a bunch of people got in my replies and said, have you ever heard of supply and demand before, sir? Economics 101. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, but no one was saying this like, two years ago, that r- mortgage rates are going to go to 7.5% and the housing market is going to be fine. That's the point. Right. It's so easy to look back and say, like, of course this happened or that happened, but no one ever says it ahead of time. It's just easy right. to look back with hindsight and say, of, yeah, course of course this happened. Right. So I guess what we're all getting at is like, right, all of this is in service to like, will there be a recession, right? At what point... Yes. And what will cause consumers to, to pull back? Callie Cox tweeted this morning in light of the GDP sales. She said, consumer spending is 70% of GDP. Okay? 70. It's everything, basically. It's hard to have a recession when spending is increasing at this pace and employment, unemployment is still low. And this is fair. I mean, at some point, people are boy who cried wolf, but all of the stuff that we have in the data – by definition, we're looking backwards. I don't, nobody knows where the data is going to be going forward. If you knew what the data was going forward, then you would, you know, then you would have an idea if the recession is coming or not. But we don't. And right now, uh, I don't see signs pointed towards it. Although, of course, I can change. All right, more stuff from Kelly Cox here. She, this, I, I got a few more things in the credit card debt. Then I'll leave this one alone. This is a. I've never seen this chart before. She, she did credit card debt as a percentage of total deposits, and she's saying that it's the lowest it's been in around twenty years. Almost is just. People have more money in the bank, the ability to hold it. Liberty Street Economics, which is, I think, part of the New York Fed, 
They did credit card delinquencies by zip code and income level as well. So you can see from the income percentile there, starts at 100, look at even like the lowest income levels, below 25, the lowest quarter of income, the delinquencies are not even there yet. Look at, look at how low they are. Nothing like they were in the 2000s or 2010s. Kind of surprised. And I, I made this point on Twitter yesterday. I'm just reading my tweets for the show today. I have this theory that finance people only inflation adjust data if it helps their argument. Right, like the, the doomers who yes. have been talking about inflation forever, like, well, in, inflation adjusts those wages or inflation adjusts those retail sales. Why don't they inflation adjust $1 trillion in credit card debt? Because if you do inflation adjust that, we're talking about credit card debt being 20% lower than it was in 2019 on an inflation adjusted basis, which actually takes it from like $1 trillion to 800 something. So I know everyone wants to think that inflation is only a bad thing, or some people want to think that it's only a bad thing, but for people holding debt, inflation is actually a good thing. It, it, it eats away at the fixed payments of your debt and makes your debt worth less than it would have been had inflation not been here. So credit card debt on an inflation-adjusted basis is way lower now than it was in 2019. Pretty wild. Right? I mean, this matters. You got to adjust. Speaking of like... Uh, no, no, you only adjust if it helps your argument. I do the same thing. Did, did you I'm see a, this? I'm a, nominal, I'm a nominal guy. I, I'd say... 95% of the time, I'm a nominal guy. I, I know inflation adjusting helps like helps comparisons through economic cycles, but I think we all our brains work nominally. Totally. We don't, we don't work on a real basis. Did you see this chart from Sam Rowe? Which one? Via Bank of America. Our deposit data continues to show signs that unemployment is picking up from these very low levels at a faster pace for higher income earners. This chart is confusing, actually. It says number of households receiving unemployment benefits through direct deposit. How many? It's a year over year, over many, year change. We're going to have to have a talk with Bank of America because how many Bank of America charts do we, do we read? And then you kind of say, wait, what does this mean? I feel like you did That's this last lot. week too. No, no, no. You're right. Because, okay, if I just look at the lines, I understand what's going on here. But it, but but then the the y-axis is it's 60%, 65%. So if you make $125,000. This is the year over year change. And what number of households receiving unemployment benefits? I think it's be be because it's unemployment benefits dropped so much that the gain is much higher now. Yeah, I guess so because they went down a hundred percent. By the way, what I see negative one hundred percent. Could something fall? <laughs> yeah, they have a ne negative one hundred twenty on here. Is that possible? Uh, I, I wouldn't think so, but I I guess. All right, this is not this is not a chart crime. It's just. Uh, I get what they're saying. I'm just confused. Exactly. I think I think the thing that matters is the trend. Okay, this is from Redfin, and this is this is what I was talking about. I read this Redfin thing. The total worth of U.S. homes hit a record of 46.8 trillion in June, overtaking the prior all-time highest out of year earlier. As a shortage of homes for sales propped up the housing market, that's an analysis on more than 90 million U.S. residential properties. So, hey, can I ask you a question? When do you use the word analyses? I feel like that's a that's a I feel like if you and I were both doing some analysis, someone would say Michael and Ben's analyses, right? I don't know if people ever use have have to use that. I don't know what what <laughs> realm you would ever have to actually put that one together. But it is a word. It's like, is it the plural of analysis? Sure. Multiple That's, people doing analysis? Doing oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. All right. So if you collectively add up all the real estate in the United States, it's now back to an all-time high even if prices maybe aren't because it kind of, you know, certain ones pick up the slack. This is interesting. Home values from, this is home values per generation. Home values for millennials surpass silent generation. So here's the total home value owned by generation. Boomers own 18 trillion. Gen X is 13.4 trillion, which Gen X is coming on strong. They're almost catching the boomers, right? 13. They're coming up the rear. Millennials at 5 so trillion and the silent generation at 4.7. It is kind of funny that you had like, no one ever talks about the silent generation, right? I mean, because they're, they're so old. Yes, but I'm saying that you had the boomers that everyone talks about, then no one really talks about Gen X. Millennials, everyone talking about, I don't know, it's just, it kind of skips a generation. So this is also interesting. Total value of homes worth between 500 and 750 increased 4.1% year over year. And between 250 and 500 saw a 4% gain. By comparison, homes worth- Wait, hang on, hang on, slow down, slow down. A lot of numbers. One more time. So we're looking at like the gain by housing price range. So gains be so houses between 250 and 750 both increased by like 4%. But 
but homes between one and two million saw a two point six percent decline. Homes between two and five million saw a seven point four percent decline. So, all right, so a bigger drop at the higher end. But unfortunately, for people coming in to buy a first time home, that's why with all this demand for millennials and household formation, those prices are still rising. So this is a bad thing. It's a Sucks. good thing if you're a rich person looking to pick up a million dollar house on great. But if you're looking to pick up a, you know, relatively good priced home for your first time home, those prices are still rising. That's not good. Ben, I saw uh, an article from Wells Fargo. How untapped equity could, could sustain the consumer. And they said an excess household savings dry up and as, as I'm sorry, excuse me, Duncan, start this over. As excess household savings dry up and as This is the first time we've had to do that in so long. Yeah, you know what? We were just talking about, you know what, Duncan? Leave it in. Leave it in. My <laughs> bad. I, I felt bad coming out of my mouth. I don't, like, I don't like that. I don't like that. We're showing the warts, warts and all. Because uh, Ben and I did a, did a podcast the other day. I was on, I was on uh, what was I on? Ask a Compound. And I said, I can't remember the last time I asked Duncan to like edit out one of my things. And I'm not sure why I just did it there. What was I thinking? It was in your head. As excess household savings dry up, and as consumer credit is both more expensive and harder to get, households have become more reliant on income growth. But many households today have the benefit of a second line of defense to support spending should the need arise. Homeowners have more equity in their homes today than they did at any point in the 35 years between 1987 and 2022. I saw this too from this, this, this report was in Sam Rose. Uh, home equity... Homeowner equity stands at 69.6%. That's slightly off its peak from 2022, but higher than any point since the late 80s. So that that's like the percentage of equity as a percentage of total value, basically. And it's up a lot since the 2012 lows, obviously. I, this is something I've been I've been talking about for a while. I think this is going to be a source, a piggy bank for people for a long time to come. And I think there's going to be companies that try to get into this space. Do you, I, I was thinking about the, the sentiment piece, and we were talking about it last week about like, the vibe session and why sentiment is so bad and and why it seems like the economy is good and unemployment rate is so low, but people still seem kind of miserable. Don't you think the housing piece is one of these? Because if you have a homeowner, hang on, hang on, I reject that premise. I don't think people are miserable. Do you? You don't. You don't get like the consumer sentiment being so low and people hating the economy. Not miserable. People hating the economy, even though it's being it's strong. You don't. No, I don't think people. I don't think that. I don't think that exists. We had anymore. this discussion last week. Okay, it, the sentiment numbers still show oh, the that soft, the soft data. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and so the soft data. So I think, I mean, isn't how no, no, no. I think I th- hang on, hang on. I think like business owners might not feel great. Small business owners don't feel great. Consumer sentiment numbers still aren't great. They're still, they're improving. Pull up the, pull up the consumer sentiment data on Y charts right now. Consumer sentiment. Yeah. U S index of consumer sentiment. Look at how low oh. it is. It's, it's rising, but it's, it's, yeah. It's well right. below You're average. Right. You're right. So but it is bouncing pretty strongly. It's, it, Wait, and again, it, it might follow gas prices, but right. is housing one of the missing pieces here? We're trying to figure out, like, why are people so unhappy? Like, home ownership rate is two-thirds of the country. I don't think it's exactly two-thirds of the people own a home, but because of apartments and all this stuff. But anyway, let's say 60% of the people own a home. The I'm 40- sorry. I just, when, when are people going to be so happy? I just, I think I reject that premise that people are so unhappy. Yeah, no, I, I agree that. I think the, I think like, the when, inf- when, when will a survey show that the entire populace is super happy. Yeah, it's just I, not. It's just. I think the it's not a thing. Political climate in the internet and social media have made it so people just aren't aren't ever going to say they're happy anymore, or they're not right. going to think other people are happy. But don't you think like if you're not owning a house, you are? If I was a young person, I'd be so angry right now if I miss the boat on this once in a lifetime bump in housing prices and low rates, and I'm renting and rent is going up. I would be so angry at the system right now. And I'm sure exactly. there are a lot of people who are like that. So is that like a missing piece of this sentiment that like, if you didn't own a house, you feel like there's this dividing line and I missed it. I'm on the other I don't side think, of it. I, don't, I got screwed. I don't, guess what? I don't even think those people are included in the sentiment data. They're not, these, these young people, they're not giving surveys. They're not being, guess what? They're not being asked. And if they were, they wouldn't answer. These are older people. Okay. So what, what point do we see trickle down to younger people actually answering surveys? Never? Never. Okay. Maybe BuzzFeed will do it. This is interesting from the Washington Post. First time home buyer, they go through all these reasons that we've already talked about why housing market is is broken or whatever. As a result, first time home buyers are older with a median age of 36. In 1981, the median age was 29. I think the the 
affordability is part of it, but don't you think that is pretty high for first time home buyer, but don't you think part of it is too that just people are going to school longer and waiting to settle down way longer than they did in the past? Yes. For home buyer, I think that's part of it too. If you especially compared to like the 1980s. Remember the big trope of BlackRock is buying all the houses and that's I why did. housing is so unaffordable? We debunked this a few times. But Rick Palacios Jr., mom and pop investors for Q2 2023 bought 64 times the number of homes than institutions did. It's just so then there's this chart from John Burns here that shows buyers, like they break them up by tiers, and it shows that mom and pop buyers are the, the biggest buyer. You can see from that gray chart there, by far the biggest buyer. There's some more institutions than there were in the past, but it's still a tiny, tiny percentage. I don't know. Maybe it shouldn't, but it, it just, the U.S. home market, I think, what did I say? It was $47 trillion. That's like the a little bit bigger than the stock market probably. The stock it's a market lot of is, clams. It's a huge, huge market. And it just, it surprises me that it's still these, these regular normal people who are buying the rentals, that are, that are buying houses to rent them out. And it's not, that hasn't been taken over. I think it just shows how hard it is to... to it's hyper-local. It really is. It, it's, it, it, I'm, I'm just surprised that institutions in Wall Street haven't had more luck coming in trying to do this. And maybe it's just because technology doesn't scale in the home, in the housing industry, in the housing market, but it just surprises me that that many regular people are the ones who are landlords. Ben, here's one thing that I got right. A lot of things I got wrong. Here's one thing I got right. Um, Victory lap time. No, no, no. It's not a, I mean, this is nothing. Uh, voice not really being a thing. The Alexa. The only thing we use it for is music. That's it. Same. I was never bullish on the idea of people talking to their gadgets to get them groceries or... So the, the person that was responsible for the Alexa at Amazon stepped down or retired. Wall Street Journal wrote, while Amazon has sold more than 500 million Alexa-enabled devices, the smart speakers largely sell without a profit on each unit. The journal reported last year that the devices unit in some recent years had an annual, annual operating loss of more than $5 billion. Pretty my, wild. I love, we love the Alexa at my house. My kids put music on all the time. And it's funny, we were driving, a, I can't remember where we were, we were driving a rental car and I didn't have a cord to plug my phone in. So we just had to listen to the radio. And my kids are like yelling at the radio to play a song. And I'm like, guys, it doesn't work like that. And they had never heard commercials before. Going back from listening to a podcast or music on demand on your phone, hooked up to your car via Bluetooth or whatever, or a plug versus the radio. I can't believe we ever used to listen to the radio back in the day. Like, remember you would, you would radio, you would have to wait to, who needs like the, a radio? Like the top five at five to listen to like a song you liked. You'd have to wait for it. It's, it's just mind boggling to me that people would just, hopefully the song I wanted to listen to comes on. Yeah. And remember commercials? Yes. It's, so I've got. I think people don't realize how this good is, they have. This is our walk. This is our walking to school uphill both ways. Is the stuff we had to deal with pre technology. I uh, I was listening to. I had Sirius on the other day in my car. There's no commercials. You could, you could notify. <coughs> you could put like favorite your favorite artist in, and it tells you when your favorite artist comes on the radio. It's incredible. Okay. Are There's you no at commercials. Least- are you at least, because that's the easiest negotiation on the planet I've heard is serious. Do you at least negotiate with them every one or two years to get a lower rate? Please, please, I, I know your, your cable company doesn't allow you, but please tell me you negotiate with Sirius. I should. I don't. You don't? I've heard that's I the don't. easiest one on the planet to negotiate. All right, done. I'll report back. And you know what else I was thinking while we're on this topic? This is not, not an epiphany. This is Captain Obvious speaking. How great are podcasts? And I know we're recording one right now. But they provide so much free entertainment. We were talking about productivity with Bob. You can't measure that. How the hell do you measure uh, satisfaction that people derive from listening to a podcast? Can't do it. I agree. But that's, I, I used to, how many hours a week? I, I, I don't know. I'm probably five hours a week at least. Oh yeah. I, I used to, my wife and I were after college, we're in a long distance relationship. I moved away for a job. She went back to school and on the weekends we would each drive like two hours to see each other. And I would listen to music the whole time and felt like I was like losing my mind after a while. Like I can't imagine now would be so much easier if you had that kind of stuff to do, right? Just to, yeah. It makes the most mundane entertaining. Are you going to listen to, uh, so the rewatchables just dropped, the rewatchables just dropped, uh, oh my God, this reminds me. Eyes Wide Shut, right? I, Eyes Wide I, Shut. I said I didn't, it was my least favorite Tom Cruise movie, but I'll, I'll so, listen, I guess. 
the, the so there's uh Ryan Rosilla does this thing that like there's nothing or he did this thing recently in this podcast. There's nothing worse than like people that tell you about their dreams. Yeah. Right? Like I'm not if stop, just stop it right there. Don't don't care. Same. Same. I'm sorry. I'm about to break that. I, I So if I could be on any podcast just once, I would kill to be on Rewatchables. I'd dump you, Ben, just for, just to be on one time. That's fair. But I, but, I, but I had a dream last night, I believe. It's just coming back to me that I met Sean Fantasy in person and w- acted like a complete psychopath and he wanted nothing to do with me. I tried to make a joke and it wasn't funny and uh, I blew my chance. All right. Thanks for that. You would have to, but you would have to do a rewatchable for a horrible movie like Crawl or The Meg Two or something. That would have to, that that be your punishment. You couldn't do a good movie because you only like bad movies. One last thing on this. Sorry, I know we're getting way off topic here. Um, first of all, Bill uh, Quentin Tarantino said the unironically Crawl was the best movie in 2019. Now I wouldn't go that far. That's that's crazy talk. But I rewatch it and it holds up. It's a good movie. Okay, I'll take your word. For it's it. a good movie. One let and and The Meg Two is coming out. I have no interest in seeing that. But the big picture did a did a podcast on like garbage fish movies, and they left out Deep Rising, which is a Shonda. But Deep Blue Sea, Jaws, which is not really garbage, obviously Anaconda. Those are my movies, as you well know, right? Monsters in the Ocean. Yeah, give me that all day. Okay, all day. Back to you, Ben. What were we saying? I got nothing. Okay. Oh, we were talking about Alexa. Anyway, that's it. I don't know. If, I don't know if they're going to be like winding it down, or I mean, they're still selling a buttload, but. Anyway, the future the future is not voice. Let's just say that. Yeah. Because no one likes to listen to someone else yell about something. It's going to have to be a brain chip planted into your head, and you think it, and then it turns on. There we go. That's that's what I'm here for. Okay. Ben, did you know this blew my face? Great quarter, guys. I'm going to give a shout to some of the some of the updates on, on quarter app, which has been sweet in a second. But before I do, Yum Brands record, reported earnings last week. Are you looking at the are you looking at this or can I quiz you? I see it. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you a trivia question, but now that you're looking at it, I won't. So, between KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell, now that I know the answer, I can't undo what I'm about to say, but I think if I had to rank first, second, third by sales, I think I would do probably, I would do Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, KFC. So I would have put Taco Bell up top. So you're, you're showing here that KFC is by far their biggest growth engine. Sales. For sales, right. And growth. So not only is that wrong, it's dead wrong. Kentucky Fried Chicken, now known as, now known as KFC, does more revenue than Taco Bell and Pizza Hut combined? What? Really? That's surprising. Especially since there's more chicken, uh, there, there are more chicken substitutes these days. Popeyes and Chick-fil-A and such. All right. Interesting. Next. Okay, so Quarter app, actually, I got to open this up. Quarter has this thing where you can highlight, you could like make highlights in the app, uh, kind of like a Kindle, I guess, where you could return to this. You could pull up your highlights. So let me just go to my Disney thing. So I listen to Disney. Where are my highlights? Transcript. Highlights. Oh, here they are. Okay. I mean, how easy is that? So I just, this is what I highlighted for when I was listening to the, to the call last time. Walt Disney World is still performing well above pre-COVID levels, 21% higher in revenue and 29% higher in operating income compared to fiscal 2019. Remember they were saying that like there was an article in the journal, which I don't, I don't, I don't really buy that, that Disney World is like, they didn't say empty. Remember that a few months ago, weeks, months? Just that it was slowing, yes. Uh... All right, Iger said, since my return, we've reset the whole business around economics designed to deliver significant sustained profitability. I can't remember what the exact number is. I, I kind of want to throw it $5 billion. That rings a bell, but massive, massive, massive cost cutting going on there. Uh, here's another quote from Iger. We're, and in the highlight section, it shows you who said the quote. So sometimes it's the CFO, the CEO. We're prioritizing the strength of our brands and franchises. We're rationalizing the volume of content we make, what we spend, and what markets we invest in. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? Well, how come uh, you spent $34 million a show on Loki? And what was the other one with Samuel L. Jackson that we t- spoke about? Invasion anyway, something. Anyway, I digress. Disney's screwed. I, I think they're going to have to like they're gonna have to spin off ESPN or sell on, to Apple. Done. They're screwed. Uh, what, uh, we're harnessing window... Windowing opportunities, perfecting our pricing and marketing strategies, maximizing our enormous advertising potential, 
And we're making extensive Hulu content available to bundle subscribers via Disney Plus. Okay, whatever. Last one. All right, e ESPN. Taking our ESPN flagship channels direct to consumer is not a matter of if but when. And the team is hard at work looking at all components of the decision, including pricing and timing. It's interesting to note that ratings continue to increase on ESPN's main linear channel, even as court cutting has accelerated. How is that possible? Um, okay. So Brandon Katz tweeted, Q2 streaming subscription changes. Netflix up 5.9 million. Peacock up 2 million. Paramount up 1 million. Hulu up $100,000. <laughs> Dollars. People. <laughs> People. Max minus 1.8 million. Disney minus 11.7 million. It's not surprising. I mean, part of that is they lost like some India sports channel thing, but yeah. The, the funny thing is, is a lot of the stuff they're trying to think about doing with ESPN now, the gambling and the spinning it off and making this own streaming thing, like that stuff they should have done like three or four years ago and they just missed the opportunity. So front office sports did an article and they said, uh, Penn wasn't ESPN's first choice and neither was the amount ESPN sought. Multiple betting industry sources told front office sports but after deals were unable to be struck with bigger players, ESPN was ultimately willing to settle for about 50% less than it had ambitiously asked for in a 10-year deal. Yeah, uh, Lucas Shaw and Matthew Puck on the town were talking about this. And yeah, they're late, super late, right? Yeah, I they're, I think they're screwed. I think ESPN is in a, like they they get rid of, they keep getting rid of people. I, I think like they're cost cutting and stuff there. I think they realize. Right, let me, then let me ask you this. Why do you still own the stock? As do I. Uh, it's a call option, right? On something happening. Iger's going to do something before he leaves. He's not going to leave this thing in shambles. So I think he's no, going to do something. No, but this is, this is, this is an something. interesting point. How you think a company might be screwed and yet you own the stock. Those two things should not exist, right? You, those should be mutually exclusive. Fair. But- It's but, the brand. I think well, the brand is a big part of it too. Disney brand. Well, that's the thing. But but it's one of the best brands in the world. Yeah. It's down, what, 55% from its highs. Bad news is not st sending the stock lower. Doesn't mean the stock can't go lower. But- the expectations, let's just say that they're not high. Right. It wouldn't, it wouldn't take a lot for this, for this stock to start working. Or maybe it's dead money, as I mentioned, as I, as I asked a couple of months ago. We'll see. We will see. Uh, all right, Ben, over to you. All right. Uh, someone sent me a DM the other day. I still have mine open. And it was the guy standing behind the tree in the yellow suit doing one of these things, like, just so excited. I don't know where that came from. And it was the headline of here's what a $5 million retirement in America looks like. This is from the wall street journal. And the funny thing is, is I had already had this in the doc before he even said it. And okay. How much Americans have saved for retirement and they break it out by different increments. And this is just in retirement accounts. So 401ks, IRAs, that sort of thing. And this is as of 2019. So take a, you know, most wealthy people have a lot of their money in taxable accounts. So take a, but they say 0.1% of family households in the United States have $5 million or more saved for retirement. Only 3.1% have more than a million dollars in a retirement account. And so it's a small number that has a ton of money saved in these tax deferred accounts, right? And they, they profile these people who have $5 million or more and how much they spend. And this one guy is- Can I say one, one thing? One thing. Yep. People, people also have taxable money. Yeah, I just said that. I'm sorry. It's, I'm sick. I've got, I've got a lot going on. I that apologize. was a 2020 of last week. But yeah, that, as I said, most wealthy pe people have more money outside of tax deferred. So that take these for what it's worth. But they do profile this guy who has is a 65-year-old guy. He has $6.1 million as a Southwest pilot. So I don't know what he got, stock options or what. But he spends $144,000 a year and he's set to receive like $40,000 a year from Social Security. So he has like a 2% spending rate. He says, my plan is to continue living below my means, staying invested and having something to leave for my kids. This other couple is $4.2 million to spend 130 k a year. And this guy's talking about how when the market was down in 2020, he was scrutinizing every purchase down to napkins. Quickly realized it was doing so was unnecessary thanks to their healthy nesting. We've talked about this before, about how people have a hard time spending money in retirement. And there's this EBRI study that says that the median household, like, spends the income from their portfolio and tries to avoid taking the principal. And I think this is one of the areas that people with money have a hardest have one of the hardest times doing is turning around and going from saver to spender. And I, I love profiles like this because it proves my point. Like all these people like have more money than they probably could spend in a lifetime and they can't spend it. They're spending like two or three percent of their portfolio. I mean there's like a big a big gap between those people. There's so there's there's a retirement crisis on the one hand. And there's people who can't get themselves to spend money on the other. Yes. And then there's, of course, you know, a million miles in between. That's a, 
there's, I mean, what percentage of the population has like the happy medium of, I saved a lot, but I'm also spending a lot and I'm not going to like bring it all with me in the grave or whatever. Like 5% of people have like a good, healthy relationship of between spending and saving. Maybe. I think I, I'm a, not to brag. I feel like I'm in that category. I'm a, I'm a healthy spender and I, you know, I, I used to be, save. I used to I'm be, a good, I'm a good saver, but I'm not an oversaver. Definitely not, definitely not an oversaver. No, I, th- having kids changed my, my feeling on that. I used to be a, like an oversaver and think frugal and spending money is bad all the time. And I've definitely let that feeling go. But I think there aren't many people who have a healthy relationship with money is my point. Fair? There aren't many? Yeah. It's a low number. Fair. All right. Let's see if you agree with this. This is a happiness study by Rob Henderson. I think it's from a book, but he highlights it. In terms of your effect on happiness, having a friend you see regularly is worth $100,000 a year in income. Being married is worth $100K. Wait, time out. Slow down. Slow down. Hold on. We're quantifying. Okay. Quantifying happiness. Okay. Getting right, divorced is like slashing your wait, income by 90000 Wait, Wait, start, start from the top. Start okay. from the top. Seeing a friend regularly is worth $100,000 a year in terms of like income to happiness. I don't Be- like my friends that much, but go on. Me neither. Being married also also worth one hundred k. Getting divorced is like slashing your income by ninety thousand. Seeing your neighbor regularly is worth sixty thousand. No what? way. And good health versus not good health is worth four hundred thousand dollars. I don't know how they determined these, but these numbers all seem so far off to me. I mean, this is very made up. Obviously. What? All right, well, what would? What would? This is a weird exercise. It is, right? The friend at the neighbor stuff, especially. Neighbor? Right? Hey, John, how you doing? <laughs> right? Good weekend? Believe yeah. the weather? Yes. Okay. Someone emailed us, Ben. I think taking a shot at you specifically, or maybe me too. Okay, bring it. I uh, love the show, but come on, man. Looking at cash as a percentage of brokerage accounts in isolation. I oh, know this is me too. And comparing that to cash percentage of retirement accounts is silly. Cash positions can be only be understood as a percentage of overall net worth or wealth and their liquidity needs. Liquidity demands that it cannot be in the retirement account. Okay. The percentage of the brokerage account that is cash reflects more about the size of the brokerage account, not the size of the cash position. If 20% of a brokerage account is cash, but the retirement savings are three times larger, then the cash percentage is only a not unreasonable 5% of the total holdings. I agree with that. However, I don't, why, why would, why would you have idle cash in your brokerage account? Right. Most brokerage accounts are meant to be invested in, not for cash. Hold- I mean, sure. Some people might have a cash sleeve, but I don't agree. I think most brokerage accounts, you put money in there to invest it in financial yeah, so assets. I, I will stand by our statement that I think this person's right about, you know, the fact that retirement accounts are often much larger. So it's not apples to apples. That's fair. But I will stand by, and I will actually die on this hill, that people behave much differently in retirement accounts than they do in brokerage accounts. Yes. And no, can't be talked off that. All right. We've been talking a lot on this podcast this year about being middle-aged, and I just have to share a story with everyone about how you and I are totally middle-aged. So I was visiting you in New York last week. We went out for dinner at a nice pizza, what, one of the famous pizza places. Good stuff. John's at Bleecker. And we, and we saw pizza. a terrible comedy show. One for six. One comedian out of six were good. It was yeah, awful. pretty bad comedy show. What do you get? It was seven o'clock show. But we we had a few beers at dinner, a couple of pitchers. We had a couple of drinks at the comedy show. In our younger years, following the comedy show, we would have looked for at least another bar or two to go to. This time, True. we're we're walking through the streets of New York looking for donuts. And it wasn't like, even it wasn't even late. It was nine thirty. It, it wasn't even yeah, I was saying it wasn't even ten o'clock. Yeah, it was not, okay, not there. And as we were walking, looking for donuts, which we found eventually at Krispy Kreme, not our first choice, but they were they still did the trick. Uh, hey, hang on, hang on. I just want just this is this is important for me. There was a donut shop that I'm almost positive used to be on the corner of Fourteenth and Sixth Avenue. So it's not like we were just randomly yeah, we, wandering. Yeah, for we donuts. ate there before. It was a donut place. Yeah, we, we did. Right, it's not there anymore. So anyway, but keep th- going. this is us being middle aged. In the past, we would have gone to look for a bar. And I, I think in the past, we would have w- woken up with a hangover from alcohol. Instead, we woke up with a hangover from food the next day. And also, as we were looking for donuts, we were crossing the street and a fan of the show was walking the other direction and said, hey, it's you, and pointed at you. And then he looked at me and said, hey, and it's you too. 
<laughs> and he said he's a he loves watching on the, us on YouTube at work. So credit to that guy for being a good listener. That was that was thrilling. All right, Ben, I got a few things. Uh, so Nicole's been asking us for our sizes for clothes for various reasons, and I say uh, I'm a large. But would anyone describe me as large? What's going on with sizes for clothes? I'm not large. I'm I'm five ten and a half, and I weigh. Listen, I put on some weight. I've said this before, so don't judge. But, but you, a, but you, the, we, you the wear don't say, looser clothes. I'm a, it's a, it's a fat weight. I don't have a lot of muscle, so it's mostly fat. I'm a hundred, I'm 186 pounds. I'm a five ten and a half. Is that, is that large? It feels kind of, I feel, I feel, I feel like average. Could you pull off a medium? Is that what you're asking? You need like a medium and a half. I can't wear a medium. I don't think it's too tight. Well, we I need, can't wear tight clothes. I look, ridiculous. we need half sizes for shirts. But large should not be average. I'm an average sized person. I should not be wearing a large. I don't know what I'm going to tell you. We're a medium and we're a little tighter. Uh, all right. I saw. I can't do that. I saw a post, uh, uh, a New York Times article that I think is complete hogwash. It said, what's the title of this post? Uh, How to use your dish dishwasher better. All right, good news. Your dishwasher should get every dish completely clean almost every time you run it without your pre-rinsing the dishes before you load them. This is complete BS. So I, Robin does most things in our household very well. She does, she does not participate in the kitchen. She doesn't cook. She doesn't do the dishes. She doesn't do anything. That's And that's totally fine. That's my domain. I rule, I rule the kitchen. And my secret to a clean house is a clean sink. The, the sink is the epicenter for dirtiness. Would you agree with that? If you start yes. stacking... Dishes, your house is messy. Okay. But in on the few occasions where Robin does do the dishwasher, and they are very few and far between, she doesn't rinse. She puts them in the dishwasher, and guess what? They come out with food all over them. Yes. And I use good I have a new I have a newish dishwasher. I use I use the good tide pods. You can't what? You have to. I, I've seen this before where I can't remember what I, what interview I heard this on a podcast where someone said for one of the companies, you shouldn't have to rinse our our soap should be able to take all stuff off. There's no well, way. Well, yeah, that that'd be great. But guess what? You have to rinse. So, are you a rinser? Do you do oh, your dishes? Of course, I. Yeah, I'm the dish. Yes, I cannot allow dishes to sit anywhere. I'm doing dishes at all times. I'm the person who, if we have a party and have people over, I'm cleaning as the party's going. I can't help myself. Same. Not only do I do the dishes, not only do I rinse, I I wash with dish soap. I also, clean the dishes before they get cleaned. Great point by Duncan. You're using Tide Pods on your dishes. What do you mean? You mean that they tide look pods? like Tide Pods? You said Tide Pods. I don't That's, know. I don't know. It's, a, it's I don't They know. look like what pods. are they? Okay. No, they're pods. Okay. Yes, they're little. I, I know what you're saying. They're okay. not Tide Pods. Uh, all right, Ben. A couple of weeks ago, I was in a house, and I made the. I told you this this on the show that somebody jiggled the handle in somebody's house and then knocked. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's not it's not locked by accident, right? Right, and then said, uh, uh, so then I, had to, so then I had to say, just a minute, second, right. you're there. <laughs> so I was in a restaurant last week, and I locked the door, and it, it's green or red, vacant or occupied, right? So there's no need to knock. It literally says if somebody's in there, right? So I'm in there, and I hear knocking. I'm like, unbelievable. Who are these idiots? I, it says occupied. I open the door. And it was my kids. <laughs> <laughs> Got to teach them. <laughs> At least they knocked and didn't just try to like crawl under or something. Last thing, I've got a, I've got a, a ten thousand dollar idea. Okay. I ordered my friend had uh, had surgery, so I ordered him a bottle of uh, alcohol on Drizzly. So this was the day that everyone was over. Uh, we were on the water. So I'm on the jet ski and I get a phone call from Drizzly. And I said, oh, thank you so much. Please knock on the door and just leave it on the steps. And he said, uh, no English. And I'm like, oh, no, what do I do? So I, I just spoke louder and slower. Knock on the door and please leave it. And he goes, no English. So I'm like, oh, no. So I'm like, uh, uh, okay, gracias. And, and I hung up the phone and I immediately, and I immediately went to Google to the English to Spanish translator, and I typed it in, and I copied it, you know, texted it. There should just be a button on your phone. There should be a, a voice button to translate into different languages. I'm sure that exists. You don't think so? That's going to be your AI 
assistant someday. I bet someone's gonna meanwhile, someone's gonna email in and say this app already exists. Meanwhile, my friend, it was it was it was nine in the morning. My friend texted me. He's like, "Thank you very much." I just limped. I just walked with a cane and in a bathrobe to the door at nine a.m. to to get a bottle of whiskey. This guy definitely thinks I'm an alcoholic. Nice work. All right, Ben. Recommendations. What do you got? Uh, okay. I just I, there's this movie, the top ten on Netflix. There's this movie called The River Wild. I saw the preview for it. It's got Adam Brody, who I, I I'm not wait. Sh- it's got what? It. It's got what? It's Adam got what? Brody. Oh, which I'm not ashamed to admit, I was an OC fan back in the day. And wait, oh, I thought you meant Adrian Brody, Adam Brody. Yeah, Adam Brody. And oh, that guy. Okay. It's called The River Wild, and it's a it's similar to the original one with. Meryl Streep and John C. Riley and Kevin Bacon. Great movie. Awesome movie. And this new movie was like, eh, it's like a 5.2. It's like, I watched the whole thing. Is it thing, the same but thing? It's just, it's, uh, you know, someone gets taken hostage on a, on a, yeah, on a whitewater raft. Different, different story, but similar premise. I just don't like the fact that a new movie can steal the old movie's name. I think that should be illegal, never allowed to happen. That's a yeah, rule. I agree with you. No it stealing, happens. Mu- no stealing it movie happens. names. They couldn't have come up with a better name, and the movie was mediocre at best. Uh, one more. Yeah, you, I agree. Hold on, that's a you can't do it. No, can't do it. One more, The Machinist, which is like Christian, one of Christian Bale's first movies. I, I caught it on Paramount Plus. I think I watched it a I long time that. ago. He got down to hundred and ten pounds. It's one of those movies where his acting performance is better than the movie. It's kind of a weird, dark movie that has a little twist at the end, actually, and. It's an okay movie, but it's a better performance than anything. And just, it's kind of amazing that he got to 110 pounds and just looks like it, it's wild how small he is. That's I have I a similar, I have a similar type of thing. I watched a movie on Hulu called Resurrection. It's not a good movie. Okay. It's not the worst movie. It's it's watchable. I'm not recommending it. I'm just saying it's it's watchable. So it's with Rebecca Hall and Tim Roth. Okay. Uh, and Rebecca Hall. I think she's the best female actor in Hollywood. She's the best leading actor in Hollywood. It's quite a statement. She's good. That's a that's a that's a leap. Oh yeah, who's better? I don't know. When's the last time she was in a good movie? The Night House. Never heard of it. <laughs> but this movie, this she's movie good, was objective. But... This movie was not good, and she made it watchable. Okay, she's a great actor. I do like her, but best actress in Hollywood. That's a stretch. There might be better. Sure, there are. She's up there. Leading. Okay. She can carry a movie. Okay. Anything else? Taking Night I'm taking Dayquil, Airborne, some zinc. You got anything else for me? Good luck. Nyquil at night. It helps. Oh, of course. But you wake up with a hangover from that as an old person now. Nyquil hangover? You ever had that before? Nope. Not great. Animalspiritspod at gmail.com. See you next time. <laughs>